in my role as a vicar, I think one of the most common conversations that I have with people is how do I know what I am supposed to do? That could be a job opportunity or a shift in career. It could be a moving of house, a relocation. It could be a relationship, whether to start or to end or to take uh, the next step. This isn't just something that happens at the start of adulthood, but this is a continual question that comes up as we make potentially life-altering decisions. How am I supposed to work, know what the right thing to do is? I think beneath that question is this underlying desire to live a good life. How do I live a life of of meaning, of purpose, of impact? The Greek philosopher Socrates wrote, the unexamined life is not worth living. And you know, uh, by taking time out of your week to sit here in this room or to tune in online or to listen later, on some level, you are seeking to live an examined life. You are kind of making steps towards, is there meaning? Is there truth? Is there something that I can do to make an impact in the world around me? And, uh, you know, I just, uh, one of the things that I think that the book of Ephesians gives us is a kind of like a secret ingredient, like this secret source to living a life well lived. So we're kicking off this series, The Beautiful, uh, Life is uh, Beautiful, because I think that one of the key points uh, that the letter makes is that you have a specific and unique potential in Jesus. Specifically you, no one else, specifically you have a unique potential and purpose in Jesus. Chapter 1, it says you've been gifted with every spiritual blessing. Chapter 2, you're God's masterpiece. Chapter 3, discover a love that surpasses knowledge. And on and on, you have been equipped with spiritual armor. Uh, You've been placed into a new community. You are unified through uh, your common belief in Jesus, that you have a specific purpose. You are made for here and now. Another great philosopher, Dr. Seuss, says this, today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. You know, I'm so excited to be kicking off this series as we wrestle with questions of what am I supposed to do? Why am I here? What decision should I next take? What is my next move in life as we journey through this book uh, of Ephesians? Because I believe there is so much wisdom, there's so much encouragement, and there are many helpful challenges as we navigate a turbulent and chaotic world that throws so many options in our faces every single day. How do we know which one the right one is to do? And how do we not only just survive this life and kind of get through it and not be too tired at the end, but how do we live with confidence? How do we live with courage, with with power, with conviction, seeking justice and beauty and love and freedom? So, Uh, Before we dive into today's reading, I want to do a bit of background, um, and to help you, I've got some pretty pictures for those of you who are like, oh, it's the history bit. Um, So, um, Ephesus, uh, which is the book of Ephesians, Ephesians is the group of people in Ephesus, um, uh, is on the west coast of modern-day Turkey. It's an important city, particularly for trade and for travel because of its uh, location, and it was one of the larger uh, cities. Paul is writing this letter. Um, he authored this letter, and he's writing to this young church plant. They're a few years old, and they find themselves in this poor city that is a significant city for trade and for travel. And it's this young church plant that has got a vision uh, to be a center uh, for social transformation uh, and the proclamation of the good news of Jesus, a little bit like us. 
And, and you know, uh, we can read all about uh, the kind of Paul's accounts of uh, um, uh, disc- uh, planting himself and then growing a church in Ephesus in Acts 19. And I really want to encourage you to go away and I want to give you two bits of homework. Read Acts 19. That will take you about three minutes. Uh, and then spend time at some point this week, make a nice cup of coffee, sit in a nice little spot somewhere uh, and read the book of Ephesians. You're like, whoa. Oh, I've never read that much in my life. It'll take you about 15 minutes ish. Um, uh, as you kind of learn and kind of get some of the context and the background, uh, um, Ephesus was a multicultural city. Uh, it became this like melting pot for all kinds of different groups. Uh, religious groups, social groups. Uh, there was all kinds of kind of deities that had been worshipped and all kinds of different uh, trade that was going on. And because it had become this uh, melting pot of lots of different pockets of people, it had become quite a divided city. There was tension in the air. And Paul had planted this church, as I said, a, a few years earlier and now he's imprisoned he's in Rome and he's writing this letter back to them in this chaotic environment in this environment uh, where there were so many different options he says this is the way of Jesus this is a way to live a meaningful purposeful impactful life so the letter itself, tiny bit more, I, I promise you I'll be quick, a uh, tiny bit more. Um, uh, I'd summarize the book of Ephesians into two parts. Part one, uh, made up of chapters one to three, is the gospel story, which is basically all saying all of human history points to and flows from the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Everything is about this this Jesus character. And because of his life, death, and resurrection, there is a new community that is created who are called the way, meaning the church. They are following the way of Jesus. And it's this creation of this multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-societal background community Unity uh, that is pursuing Jesus, seeking the renewal of all things. It's the story of the gospel that Jesus transforms lives and creates community. Uh, and then uh, part two, which is made up of chapters four to six, is basically saying uh, because of the gospel tra- uh, story, you should expect to be transformed. You should expect your habits, your lifestyles, your desires to start to change, and not just you, but it should then start to change the world around you. As this story, this story of good news impacts you, it flows out and changes the world around you. Networks, neighborhoods, all becoming made new because of being impacted by your story. So, It's part one and part two, and here's what lies at the heart of the letter. The gospel, the good news, is not, it's not just a good idea. It's not just a kind of life as it was before, but like a little bit better and a little bit newer, and you behave a little bit differently, and you maybe gossip a little bit less, and you swear a bit less, and you kind of have like sort of mild-tempered coffee outside on freezing cold Sundays, uh, all to like huddle together, and you wear socks and sandals, and you uh, love everyone. It's, It's not just that, although that is obviously intrinsically very important part of the gospel. Um... This is radically good news. This is completely different news to the world. And the goodness of it is this, that when you start to follow the way of Jesus, you experience total heart regeneration. This is not just behave differently. This is not just think differently. This is a total regeneration of the heart, new spirit, new identity, completely transformed in Jesus. Therefore, change. It's this word, therefore, it comes up uh, right at the turn between ch- uh, the part one and part two. Chapter four, verse one, it says, therefore, because of what Jesus has done, And what he has ushered in through this new community, we should expect to see personal, communal, and cultural transformation. We should expect to see that. 
The way of Jesus leads to the total regeneration of your heart. Therefore, the reorientation of your life. There's this amazing film, wonderful film, called Life is Beautiful. It was made in 1997 and uh, winner of three Oscars, including Best Actor uh, that year. It's the story of this Jewish-Italian uh, man named Guido uh, during the Second World War. Uh, he and his wife and his uh, five-year-old son are living a, a good life and then w World War II comes and they are sent to a concentration camp under the Nazi regime. And what uh, this man does to kind of protect his son from the horrors and the atrocities uh, that no anyone should ever face, let alone a five-year-old, uh, what he does uh, is he makes the whole, the whole thing, his whole life, into an adventure and a game. He takes moments and opportunities, these moments in this horrific situation, uh, and he, he kind of reinterprets everything into something that is joyful into beauty, into freedom, into humor and laughter. He reorientates towards joy and grace and peace. And you know, this is our story. That inner, chaotic, turbulent world, in a world of broken promises, we can reorientate our lives towards the faithful promises of Jesus. In a world that is hurting and fearful, we can reorientate towards love and protection. It's light in the darkness, hope to the hopeless, and it's connection for the isolated. And you know, a beautiful life, it doesn't mean a life free from discomfort, free from disappointments, free from setbacks or even uh, suffering. It just means in the midst of those things, in the midst of the inevitability of pain and suffering in the world that we live in, we have a path for our feet and we have a hope for our future. You see, turning up to church on Sunday is so great. And I'm probably way more happy that you're here than you're happy that you're here. And like this, you know, this is like goals for me. Um, uh, but that's not it. Turning up to church is not the life. It's not the beautiful life. It is just merely part of it. But discovering your God-given identity, growing and learning in the way of Jesus, un uh, uncovering the truth of his word as you daily uh, submit yourself to uh, the way of Jesus through, the, uh, through his words in the Bible, to, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, encountering him on a daily basis. Like That is a life that is well worth living. That will lead you to discover a life of meaning, of purpose, of impact. That will lead you to a life that is beautiful. So, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. You may have heard the words that uh, Judith read for us uh, and thought, oh, what a lovely Bible passage. Such like lovely descriptive language. Uh, and you know, it is that. Um, but within there, there is loads of theological controversy. There are loads of um, uh, themes that are picked up on in that passage that uh, result in endless debates and discussion. You've got predestination and election and many other things. And um, what is my absolute pleasure for the next sort of two and a half hours uh, that we've got together, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just fully go ahead and avoid all of that. Because, here's why, uh, trying to kind of, I'm not trying to skirt around anything today, and, and actually I've handed that on to Johnny for next week, and he's going to cover all of those things. Um, uh, but here's why it's important that um, these kind of themes uh, that are picked up on in this passage, they're not just dry and lifeless doctrine that you should listen to uh, in a lecture theater, but they are caught up in this amazing song and moment of, uh, of praise and declaration about a wonderful, magnificent and other mysterious God. It's important that we reframe at the reading of Ephesians 1 in the light of the grace and the peace 
and the blessings that come from God. You see, what we have here at the start of this letter is this song of praise, this song of thankfulness, this song that describes this glorious kindness and holiness. One uh, theologian says this, chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians is Paul's doxology set to music. He's kind of like riffing off this explosion of joy and wonder and otherness as he looks towards his Savior in Jesus. And he starts this letter in this place of praise because it's where we should also start. You know, we are called to worship God. Not worship the God of our imaginations. Not worship the God that we would like to fit into our already okay lives. But to worship the true God of the universe. Who created us in his image. We didn't create God of our imaginations in our image, but there is a distinct and specific and other and mysterious God to whom we send our praise and our worship. And we don't worship God because we are told to. We don't worship God because we have to or we begrudgingly kind of turn up and sing a few songs. But it gives us a clue here in verse 3. We worship God because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ are ours. They belong to those who follow the way of Jesus. That is insane. That you are forgiven. That you are made new. That you are given power. That you are given purpose. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Going back to the conversation that I have with people, how do I know what I'm supposed to do with my life? I'm, I'm always surprised when people look at other people who are living their life, maybe people who have been successful in their career or uh, people that they look up to for whatever reason. And uh, often I find that people say this, oh, I could never do it like that. I could never do that. I could never be that successful in my job, or I could, I could never have that kind of relationship, or I could, I could never do that. And they sometimes, I know, try not to laugh, but they sometimes say that about me. Okay, yeah, I know, we get it. Um, uh, but they look at what I do and they think, gosh, I couldn't stand in front of a room of people and, and speak. Gosh, that's so terrifying. What do you, how do you even know what to say? I, like, I spend literally six days preparing it. Um, that's a joke. Meh. Um, they say, like, well, how do you do what you do? And I'm sitting there thinking, do you not know that everyone is faking it until they make it? Do you not know that we, like, all feel like that on some level in our lives? Even the people that you look up to most, they don't think they completely have it all together. They are battling with their own uh, demons and doubts and their own insecurities. And I think we sometimes make the mistake that we're the only ones that doubt ourselves. We're the only ones that struggle. We're the only ones that think we can't do it. We're actually all unified around the fact that every single one of us has to deal with imposter syndrome at some point or on some level in our lives. What that means is basically it's battling with those voices in your head that tell you you don't have what it takes. You're not enough. You're not going to be able to get from A to B. I'm not sure I'm kind enough to be married to this person. I'm not sure I have the patience to parent these children. I'm not sure I have what it takes to get the job done. I'm not sure I can keep faking it this much and keep overworking this hard and overthinking everything for this long. And you know what's beneath that? It becomes, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel like this? So let me ask you as you take a moment to reflect, what are the loudest voices in your head? 
What are the voices that you are listening to? You know, I think most of us could resonate with that on some level because it's just the human experience. If you're here thinking, oh gosh, there's something wrong with me, feeling guilty or or feeling shameful, don't feel that. That's one, that's not from God. And two, this is just the human condition that, that, that we are broken Our story starts uh, in the Garden of Eden where God says everything is good. Everything is beautiful. This is the way it's supposed to be. And and what humanity did is that they rebelled against that. And we we call that sin. And um, And humanity said, we've got a better way to be human. We think that we can do a beautiful life better than you, God. And so we're going to do it this way. And what that creates is separation and distance between the way we were supposed to be and the way that we experience life now. And this is where the good news comes in because it reverses that pattern. It reverses that situation. And it says that in Jesus, you now have every spiritual blessing that is available in Jesus now comes to you. You have adoption into a new family. You have purpose. You have freedom. You have life. You have health. You have joy. All of that is now available to you. You have a loving Father God who basically stands over your life and says, you have got this. You can do this. You are enough. You can get through life. You can actually not just get through, you can excel and experience a life full of beauty. The word here for blessing in the Greek is eulogia, which is where we get the word eulogy from. When someone stands up at a funeral and speaks the blessings of that person's life, say this is what they were good at, these are the memories, the fondness, we celebrate this life as we commit it to you, God. That's what you're doing in a eulogy. And what Paul is doing here is he's giving a living eulogy to a living God, saying, look at what he has done for you. You have been forgiven. You have been given new life. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're adopted into his family. You're given a new community. Nothing has been held back for you. And as we start to discover and hear and hear again and remind ourselves of these beautiful truths, this beautiful song of worship uh, that Paul speaks over us in Ephesians is that we respond in praise. You see, as, as we realize that we are blessed by Jesus, and we realize that we have been taken out of nowhere and been placed into this amazing uh, position of, of authority and new identity, what it creates is its thankfulness, its praise, its, its turning our attention towards God to say, oh my gosh, this is amazing that you would have done this for me. It creates this cycle of praise as we, as we thank God, he blesses us. And because we've been blessed, we thank him and we thank him and he blesses us again. It's basically, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. As Chance the Rapper, the other theologian and great philosopher of our time said. As the praises go up, the blessings come down. Verse 6 says this, So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us. Here's the thing that I want us to focus on as we finish today. That it is grace that initiates and enables a beautiful life. This is made possible because of the grace of of God. The blessings, the peace, the wisdom, the new identity, the new position is all enabled because of grace. Grace simply means a free, undeserved gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't strive for it. You didn't achieve it. It is just simply given to you. A friend of mine uh, was recently putting his four-year-old daughter to bed and uh, in that tender moment as they finally calm down and um, uh, you're holding them and uh, you sort of sung them some songs, he, he kind of locked eyes with his daughter and he just said, I love you, sweetie. 
just like this moment he said he was like I was just overcome with emotion I just had to pour my love on her and um, uh, she kind of locked gaze locked eyes with him caught up in his gaze receiving his love turns to him and says I hate you daddy <laughs> she's still like learning language and phrases but you know, it's like this picture that grace lo loves without expectation or requirement of a return. Grace, the grace of God, it is just freely poured out on you, actually whether you want it or not. Actually, whether you choose to see it or not, God, God does the first pouring of grace. And all we simply do is just say, wow, isn't that amazing? that God has chosen to first put uh, poor grace on us. It's amazing, it's wonderful, but it's also, it's disruptive. Grace disrupts the way we were living. It disrupts the patterns and the thoughts and the habits of our old life, and it, and it sets us onto a new daily rhythm. Grace disrupts uh, the way that we were caught in isolation and separation uh, that was caused by sin, and it sets us into a new family. It says we are adopted into a new family, a place of honor, a place of notoriety. See, grace it is so hard to get our head around because it's so alien to us in our world today. We can't achieve it. We can't earn it. We can't pay for it. We cannot win at grace, and nor can we lose at grace. It simply is what it is. It is just the generous gift that is given by God himself. And that's why Paul frames this whole song of worship. In verse 2, it says, Grace and peace to you. He wants to start this journey of this letter, and that's where we want to start the journey of this series. We want to start by just gazing at the grace of God. You know, one of the things that it kind of pains me from this last year is that I just fear that we've lost something in worship. As we gather together, we're not able to sing, and yes, that is hard. And as we've been gathering online and kind of basically just watching a TV program, which is church, and I'm so, so grateful for that, and I'm so, so grateful that we can still do that now. But there is a challenge for us in there, that we don't lose the wonder, that we don't lose the awe, the otherness of God, the amazing grace of God in our worship. And so there is an opportunity, whether we're worshipping at home, whether we're in the shower, whether we're on the way to work in our car, to be able just, just to sing and just to, just to describe and exclaim the wonders of who God is. You know, there are many ways for us to worship and God creatively puts uh, um, uh, poetry and art and like an awe of creation in us and through us. But as we'll discover later on in Ephesians, that one of the marks, one of the key marks of being filled with the Spirit, it says that they are filled with song and melody and praise and music towards God. And so oh, what, the thing that pains me is that, gosh, gosh, we can't do that together, but we can do that as we are at home and we can do that as we go about our daily lives and say, yes, I'm glad that you're here, but I'd be more glad if you spent the rest of your week in worship. If you spent the rest of your week reminding yourself of the grace and the wonder and the awe of who God is. I've learned um, a lot about filming in this last year, um, and I've even learned what this does. Um, this is apparently called a clapper, even though the 10, I called it a snapper. Um, uh, and what it does is it's kind of, is. Hang on, let me give you an example. What it does is, uh, as you snap it, for the person editing the talk or syncing up the live stream, as in fact, if I'm now out of sync, there you go, um, uh, what it does is it syncs the audio with the visual. 
uh, uh, for live broadcasting and for recorded content. It's kind of at the moment that the wood hits the bottom bit, you can line that bit up with the audio spike and the moment, uh, and the moment where you see uh, the clapper snap together. And so you can realign the audio and the visual. And I just feel like in worship, this is what we are doing. Whether for the first time or, or for the thousandth time, we are just re-snapping, re-clapping our hearts and our attention back in line with the truth of who God is, back in line with his grace, back in line with, I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing that is available to me in Jesus. That God is full of wisdom, full of wonder, full of otherness. That God is who he claims he, he was, that Jesus is who he claims to be, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And, and in worship, when we come, and uh, whether that's singing or however else you want to engage with God, worship simply just putting your attention on God. What that does, it kind of snaps you out of your old life and reminds you of who you are in Jesus. It snaps you out of your doubt. And it puts you back on track on the path towards the way of life and freedom. It snaps you out of your fear. And it says you have nothing to fear. You have every spiritual blessing that is available to you in Jesus. You don't have to worry. It will not add any moment to your life. Instead, put your trust in me. Put your faith and your hope in me. And so in worship, we set our eyes back on Jesus and as we start this series as we desire to live a beautiful life of purpose of meaning of breakthrough of impact we have to start in worship gazing at an amazing God who has done the most amazing thing for you and me by setting us free and so that's where we are going to start today I want to encourage you to stand, and all I'm going to do is just read the words uh, that we have read uh, from Ephesians 1, this amazing song, this declaration, this doxology of praise. Uh, but I want, to, I want you maybe just to shut your eyes, just to hear these words afresh. And for some of you, uh, this will be like a first time. For some of you, this, this will be a, a snap, and it will be a moment where you realize God is for me. God is for me. God loves me. God desires company with me. For some of you that I believe in this moment or at home, the Spirit will make a breakthrough. And for some of you, it's been a while. For some of you, it has been a hard year and you have lost something in worship and you have feel like you have been consuming. And it's just going to be a moment. I believe that as you turn your attention to him, that the Spirit of God will just snap you back as you discover the God who has arms open wide, ready to receive you as you run home to him. So let me read these words and we'll respond in worship. Even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ. He chose us to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us. He adopted you into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this is what he wanted to do because it gave him great pleasure. And so we praise God for the glorious grace he poured out on us to those who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins, that he showered his kindness on us with all wisdom and all understanding. Holy Spirit, move in this place as we turn our attention to you, your gracious, loving, kind Father. Our self-giving Savior and our empowering Spirit, come meet with us as we worship. I don't want to be free. 
afraid every time I face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roll. I don't want to fear the storm. I don't want to fear the storm. Say the word and I will Set my feet upon the sea Till I'm dancing in the deep Peace, be still You are here so it is well Even when my eyes can't see I will trust the voice that speaks Peace I'm not gonna be afraid these waves are only waves I don't want to be afraid I don't want to be afraid I'm not gonna fear the storm You are louder than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm Rise up in